what this battle between Satan and Jesus is over. It's over our hearts, over who wins the heart. This week, with the second impeachment trial going on in the Senate, everybody's talking about mobs and who is responsible for inciting the mob that attacked the U.S. Capitol. And I'm really amazed how often what is happening in our world and in our country, how it relates to the passage we find ourselves in in Scripture. Because last week, Jesus was the victim of a mob. In fact, we discovered this definition of mob rule. Mob rule is when people aren't driven by wisdom, law, or truth, but rather by the loudest, most powerful, and usually angriest voices. And that's exactly what we saw on Capitol Hill, which is what this impeachment trial is. It goes on to try to determine who instigated the mob, who is responsible for inciting violence. And by the way, by the time you watch this, the Senate may have already voted as I, as I record this. It hasn't happened yet, but someone is very responsible for the violence. And I'm not talking about President Trump. I'm also not talking about Antifa in the crowd or QAnon. And I'm not talking even about the QAnon shaman. I'm not talking about the radical right wing or the radical left wing. And I'm not talking about right wing or left wing media outlets. It comes down to who incites the mob. You want to know the dirty secret? about who really caused the Capitol riots? We don't need a trial. I'll tell you right now who's behind it. Because it's the same person responsible for causing every riot that burned our cities, including here in the Portland area, for the past seven months. It's the same snake that for thousands of years has riled up mobs and directed them, getting them angry and furious, demanding rights and violently marching through cities and communities, stealing, killing, raping, and breaking and destroying. And we saw a mob break out and directed by him to get their rage against Jesus to try to kill him last week. Well, obviously I'm talking about Satan, the former angel once named Lucifer, who led a mob of angels in rebellion against God, taking a third of heaven with him as he was thrown from heaven to earth, which is right where we find ourselves this week in Luke chapter 4. We're going to discover our enemy. It's not people who disagree with us. It's not people who lash out against us. Our very real enemy is Satan himself. And he wants to destroy us. And from this passage, we will discover our hearts are the battlefield of a very real war. So let's dig in where we left off last week. Luke chapter 4 verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Again, this was Jesus' hometown. We compared it to we three after touring the world, after America's Got Talent, coming home to McMinnville to do a homecoming concert on the 4th of July two years ago. Well, same thing with Jesus. Teaching and doing a world tour in synagogues all over Galilee, their home state. And then coming home to to the town he grew up in, Nazareth. And the whole town was buzzing. And when he didn't meet their expectations, they turn on him. They go from treating him like a rock star to trying to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. That mob trying to kill him, it was inspired by Satan himself, who knew Jesus was the Messiah and wanted to kill him before it all went down. But Jesus following God the Father and full of the Holy Spirit, he just walks through the crowd, through the mob, and left and went on his way. So, where did he go? Well, let's find out. Verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. We know Jesus had been to Capernaum and had actually taught in that synagogue before. In fact, Jesus, we learned from last week, that Jesus had taught in the synagogues throughout the region of Galilee. But now, things are different. Because Jesus was not only publicly identified as the Messiah by John the Baptist, 
but publicly declared himself the Messiah from his hometown of Nazareth. But obviously, they rejected him. So Jesus moves. He centers his ministry out of a different town, Capernaum, which you can see on this map. That's about 20 miles northeast from Nazareth on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Kind of interesting the mob from Nazareth doesn't follow him. I mean, Jesus doesn't go into hiding. He continues a very public ministry. If their accusations were based on truth and facts, legitimate charges to stone him to death, they would have followed him to Capernaum to make sure he died. But that's not how mob rule works. It's not based on truth, evidence, or facts. But rather, mobs are fueled by emotion and anger. Because what you're filled with is what you're controlled by. And as soon as the heat of emotion dies down, the mob loses power. And ultimately, the dark forces behind mobs lose their ability to incite the crowd. Jesus knew that the Nazarene mob wasn't his enemy. Satan was his enemy, trying to destroy him and the people of Nazareth. Very clearly, the people of his hometown were on the battlefield of a very real war. The rest of verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. A couple of things here. You realize what this battle between Satan and Jesus is over. It's over our hearts. Over who wins the heart as Lord of each individual person. Remember what we learned two weeks ago from 2 Corinthians 4? That the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan is the God of this age. We learned who gave Satan rulership over this age, over this world? We do. Satan has been elected ruler of this age every year by popular vote in our daily decisions. Satan is the major influence on the ideas, opinions, politics, wisdom, media, education, hopes, and dreams of the majority across this planet. In a sense, he controls our minds and hearts. Because we live in a fallen world, we belong to him. We are his territory. And even if we don't know it, most people are oblivious to the reality that if Satan can just get us to be focused and consumed with ourselves, we are doomed to destruction. And that's his goal. But Jesus invades our space to free us from Satan's grasp. And you talk about D-Day and the Allies unleashing a vast armada against the Nazi front. Jesus does the same thing. Whatever it takes to win our hearts until we surrender to freedom and switch allegiances. Who we obey, who we fight for, who we live for. And we see the battle of our hearts on this battlefield of Galilee with the hearts of Nazareth rejecting Jesus as a stronghold of the enemy. But the hearts of Capernaum accepting Jesus and being amazed at his teaching. Why? Because his words were different. They had authority. You know, rabbis of that time didn't teach with authority. Number one, because they didn't teach with the power of the Holy Spirit. They taught based out of the, the writings and the opinions of other rabbis. They were constantly quoting other rabbis and teachers. They were like religious lawyers who quote past cases and judgments. But Jesus, he was different. He didn't teach by the opinions of other rabbis. He taught with authority. Well, where did he get his authority? Well, number one, from who he was, God the Son. Number two, from being completely dependent upon his Father. And number three, because he was full of the Holy Spirit. The people of Capernaum had never heard teaching like this before, and they knew it was from God. And one more thing, Nazareth? Yes, it was a stronghold of the enemy, but the people of Nazareth were not Jesus' enemy. They were like French citizens in France 
occupied by the Nazis. Satan and his demonic forces are the occupying enemy. The people of Nazareth were just deceived prisoners of war. Because you know who lived in Nazareth and watched the mob try to kill Jesus? Mary, his brother James, his brother Jude. And James and Jude, at this point, didn't believe in Jesus. They're not going to believe in Jesus until after Jesus raises from the dead. But at this point, their hearts were enemy-controlled territory. Our hearts are the battlefield of a very real war. Verse 33. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. Notice this possessed man was actually in the synagogue. You know, we can relate to that here at Calvary Mac. Last year, before COVID, we had a homeless man who was demon-possessed. And he kept hanging around our property. And he would sometimes come into our services on Sunday. Well, at one point, he stood up while I was teaching and screamed out profanities at me. And then he walked out flipping off our cameras. That was kind of scary stuff. But we had nothing to fear. That man was not the enemy. He was merely a prisoner of war that Jesus Christ came to free. Same thing with this possessed man at the synagogue in Capernaum. Was this man the enemy of Jesus? Absolutely not. He was the victim of deception of Satan in this war. He was a POW, enslaved by a demon. Again, we talked about this two weeks ago. Satan is a very real person. He was once an angel named Lucifer who fell in rebellion. Same thing with demons. They are very much real and more active in our world than any of us realize. They are spiritual beings under the command of Satan, whose very purpose is to kill, destroy, and drive people away from Jesus. And people open their lives up to demonic influence or even possession through embracing some sin or through involvement with cults or new age or false religions, even through exposing ourselves to some forms of meditation, Ouija boards, demonic games or spells such as witchcraft, music, drug or alcohol abuse, anything that alters one's state of consciousness can open that door. Just casual marijuana use or transcendental med meditation, which is so popular in Hollywood, it can open our minds up to demonic influence or in the worst cases, possession. And being possessed or filled with a demon, I mean, obviously it's bad stuff because what you're filled with is what you're controlled by. And we're going to see throughout the New Testament that demon possession is violent. And like a nuclear bomb of devastation to the life of a person. Because don't ever forget, they are not the enemy. Their heart is a battlefield of a very real war. And just like that demon-possessed man screamed out in our service, this demon-possessed man did the same thing to Jesus. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Don't ever forget that Satan, the fallen angels and demons, they all believe in Jesus. They have no doubt Jesus is the Son of God. And they recognize the reality of God on a far grander scale than we do because they've experienced it. Remember, Lucifer was an angel of God who had been in the very presence of God. He was in the garden, and he knows it's all true. He spent thousands of years poring over the Bible to pervert it and find a loophole out of the eternal damnation, which he knows is an eternal fire. Satan and his legions, they believe in God. James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. They believe in God, but refuse to obey God. They foolishly believe they can destroy God's plan and people, thereby preventing their own destruction. Which is why this demon meeting Jesus in the synagogue is absolutely terrified that Jesus is there. This demon cries out through this man, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Ironically, 
This demon grasped who Jesus was, but those from his hometown of Nazareth didn't. This demon is terrified that Jesus' presence says that the kingdom of God would spell the demise of demonic control over the world. But Jesus wants no affirmation from demonic sources. So he says, be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Think about who Jesus is. The Son of God, living completely dependent upon God the Father and full of God the Holy Spirit. Jesus demands complete authority over the spiritual world. The demons have to obey because of the authority of who Jesus is. That same authority that came out of his teaching that the people of Capernaum were amazed by. So the demon throws the man down and comes out, freeing the man, it says, without injuring him. I was a youth pastor in Colorado, and there were these two depressed young men, Brandon and Caleb. Both were into really dark and demonic card games. Both were furiously angry all the time and causing problems at home and at school and even at church. Well, Caleb's parents, they, they kind of gave up and sent him off to Chicago to live with his brother. And in that time, he found Jesus as his Savior. Well, a year later, Brandon's parents brought Brandon in to meet with the lead pastor because of all the issues he was causing at home. Well, and Caleb was back home, and he was invited to join the meeting too. Well, Brandon is sharing why he's so angry when Caleb speaks up and says, Pastor Tom, would you mind if I said something? I felt just like Brandon, but my brother and his friends did this. And Caleb lays his hands on Brandon and says, In the name of Jesus Christ, come out. Well, Brandon falls to the floor, starts foaming at the mouth and rolling around and yelling and screaming. And suddenly it all stops. He was free. Brandon was possessed by a demon, but he was now free by the name of Jesus Christ. Because at the name of Jesus, demons shudder and must obey his authority. Our hearts are the battlefield of a very real war. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what words are these? With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. You know what that means? The surrounding areas? Well, guess who else heard what happened and how even the demons obey this man, Jesus? Well, the people of Nazareth heard. The mob that tried to throw him off a cliff and he had to slip away from. His brothers who didn't yet believe in Jesus and would later mock him ruthlessly. But don't forget... They are not Jesus' enemies. None of them. They're occupied territory. The enemy is Satan. And Jesus is fighting for their hearts, even if they don't yet realize it. The people of Nazareth's hearts, including his own brother's hearts, are the battlefield of a very real war. Verse 38. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Quick note on this because there's strong archeological evidence for both of these locations. These are the ruins of a synagogue at Capernaum built in the fourth or fifth centuries. But archeologists have dug down below these ruins and they found the foundations of an older synagogue that would have been the actual synagogue, the one that Jesus actually taught in. And then you have Simon Peter's house just a little ways away, which archaeologists and historians have discovered a private house in Capernaum that early Christians made pilgrimages to and was later converted into a church in the 4th centuries. And most historians are certain that these are the ruins of Peter's home, which is where the next passage happens. The reasons why we find supporting archaeology is because this isn't mythology. It's not Roman mythology or Greek mythology. It's history that actually happened. And Satan is at war through the systems of academia to fool people into believing it's just religious foolishness. Our minds are the battlefield of a very real war. Well, this, this home, this picture... 
This is where this all happened. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Isn't that just reality, moms? You're sick, and you meet Jesus, and you're healed, and immediately it's back to taking care of people. Well, if you haven't seen the first season of The Chosen, put it on after we finish because, wow, do they capture Peter, his wife and family, and all this scene. They, they totally get it right because they base their incredible show on Scripture, such as right here in Luke chapter 4. Don't miss the authority Jesus demonstrates throughout this passage. First, the authority of his teaching. Then the, his authority over demons. Well, now, the authority to heal the human body miraculously. Now, pause for a second. Remember the context. It's Luke writing to his friend Theophilus, who was a Christian, struggling with doubts. Remember Luke's profession? He's a physician. Do you think he knows something about healing and what it meant for Jesus to just speak and a fever leaves an old woman? Luke and Theophilus' hearts are the battlefield of a very real war. Well, so is the heart of this man, Simon, who we know becomes Peter. Now, Simon's heart was personally touched by Jesus. Verse 40, At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! Can you see Jesus' ministry has gone full public? And it's more than rumors and whispers of a great teacher. He's actually healing miraculously and casting demons out left and right. But Luke shares that just like that first demon, these demons are yelling, You are the Son of God! Which, yes, it's true. Jesus is the Son of God, but not a reliable source of an endorsement you want to be associated with. But can you see the, the battle strategy here from Satan? The demons have to obey. They have to leave at Jesus' commands. But they try to hurt Jesus' reputation by their association. The people's hearts were the very real battlefield of a very real war. And Jesus didn't want people to believe because of the testimony of demons. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. They had to obey. They could not speak at Jesus' authority because of who he was. God the Son, dependent upon God the Father, full of God the Holy Spirit. The people's hearts were the battlefield of a very real war. And Jesus silenced the strategy of these demons. Verse 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to him where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. I love how Jesus found time to be alone, off spending time with his Father and with the Holy Spirit. But the crowds still track him down. They believed because Jesus was giving them what they wanted. Yes, there was faith being built, and hearts were being won, but there was a lot of emotion involved. And, and again, Satan wants us to get our hearts focused on the wrong priorities. And quickly, we see this idea of a mob, a group of people starting to follow emotion rather than obedience, who track him down desiring more fireworks, more wonder, more miracles. But Jesus didn't live to please people. He lived to please his Father. And even though it could mean another crowd turning on him, he speaks the hard truth. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And as we finish, I just want you to think about Jesus moving on from this crowd that was accepting him. He could have stayed there and just stayed ministering to people who were seeking him. But he moved on because Jesus had an eternal perspective. He knew that this was war. And this war was far bigger than the hearts of one small fishing village. 
Jesus had other hearts to win, which meant ministering throughout Galilee and ultimately all Judea, which was the overall term for Israel at this time. Jesus moved on because this was his war plan, his strategy to not just win people's hearts and battles, but to win the war, fought every day on the battlefields of our hearts, fought to this very day, and everything that happens right now, today, every geopolitical move, every historical event, every political decision, every riot, every pandemic, right down to every individual decision you and I make, Every priority in our lives, how we choose to spend our time, what we focus on, how we treat our wives and our husbands, how we treat our kids, where we go to school or to work, all of it, the whole universe is a part of this great war for our hearts. And quite honestly, that's all that matters. And that explains why there's so much suffering in the world. Because the world is crammed full of casualties of this war, trapped as prisoners of war by Satan, slaves to who we're not even aware we obey, with most people completely oblivious of why they feel trapped. But here's the secret. Jesus, he already won the war on the cross, crushing Satan's plan once and for all. And we can be free. It sounds backwards, but we can be free by allowing Jesus to conquer our heart by laying down our defenses and just saying, Jesus, I surrender to you. You are my Lord and I give you my whole heart, all of my territory of my will and my life to you. God bless you all.